thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you this evening and to share an evening of Thomas Merton with you. I'm really honored to be here, and I bring you greetings from the Thomas Merton Society in Vancouver, where we had a Merton retreat on Saturday, and they said, oh, be sure to take our greetings to everybody in Alberta. So poor old Yank has to carry the <laughs> greetings from one Canadian city to another Canadian city. I'm especially grateful to Judith Hardcastle, who made my arrangements in Vancouver, and to Dr. Chance, who made them here in Calgary, and to St. Mary's for hosting us this evening. And I think we might just take one little moment of silence to be grateful for being welcomed this evening and to think about all those people in the world who tonight have no welcome. Thank you. Uh, I hope you picked up an outline when you came in. And if you didn't, I'm sure somebody will get extra credit points by handing out outlines and dusting erasers and things like that. If anybody needs an outline, uh, you can follow along and you'll see where we are in the lecture. Um, you can doodle and I'll think you're taking notes. <laughs> and especially when we get to the point of talking about the poem at the end of the lecture, I think it's just useful if you have the text of a poem in front of you. How many of you know something about Merton? It would help me to just know. Oh, good. All right. Well, then I'll sort of simply launch into the subject of the evening rather than saying too much about Merton, whose, I think, rootlessness and privilege and conversion experience made him something of, a, something of a, an exemplary figure in the 20th century. His literary legacy, as you know, was very great. And the subject matter that he dealt with was so um, varied. Uh, a, a great writer on ecumenism, in our country, a great voice for social justice and for contemplative spirituality. And to my mind, that was the three great theological issues of the second half of the 20th century that carry into our century ecumenism and social justice and contemplative spirituality. In my view, Merton will be the voice from our country for the second half of the 20th century. I think his new seeds of contemplation may be to our age what the cloud of unknowing was to the 14th century or um, the writings of Trays of Avila were to, to her century. I, in every sense, uh, Thomas Merton was a priest, a pontus, a bridge, if we can use that as our opening image. But by means of his own openness and interest and Christian humility, he allowed people to walk back and forth across raging rivers of religious bigotry. He threw a bridge over that particular swollen stream and particularly provided a way for us to visit the great religious traditions of the East. Judaism, Islam, Christianity, which remember is an Asian religion by geography, uh, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism. All of these are subjects that Merton dealt with. And I think it might be useful to start out with his principles of religious dialogue, just so you'll know the, the format from which Merton was thinking. He was, to give a, uh, he was to have given a paper in Calcutta in 1968 on the principles of religious dialogue. And unfortunately, he died before he got there. But he left the notes. And let me just four principles for you so that you'll know the context out of which Merton speaks. First, and I think this is one we can't quite manage this evening, Merton believed that dialogue is reserved for those who have been seriously disciplined by years of silence. Most of us don't come to a talk in the evening by the from the discipline of silence. But I think that's an important principle to bear in mind. Secondly, he says that in religious dialogue, there's no question of facile syncretism. You know, that easy mixing of this bit from one religion and that bit from another religion. That's, that's not what Merton is about. Because thirdly, he says in religious dialogue, we have to have a scrupulous respect for religious differences. 
being articulate about and respectful of our differences across the religious community is important. And fourthly, what is essential is to be sought in the area of self-transcendence. Self-transcendence, moving out of self and toward others. My assignment is to say a little something this evening about Merton and Buddhism, and what I propose to do is threefold. First, to explore the origins and extent of Merton's studies of Buddhism. Secondly, to ask what I think is a fair question, why would a Christian and a monk be interested in Buddhism? What's that all about? And finally, to give one brief example of the interplay between Buddhism and Christianity in Merton's thought. I used to say to my students, my job is to talk and your job is to listen. Please let me know if you finish first. <laughs> After a long day's work, if, if you finish listening before I finish talking, please give me some signal so that we won't suffer through the evening together. So first, Merton's acquaintance with Buddhism. And I think it's helpful for us to think of this in terms of three periods. The pre-monastic, the monastic, and the Asian. The pre-monastic, the monastic, and the Asian. If you understand the deep connectedness of Buddhist nonviolence and the idea of ahamsa, or non-injury, in Hinduism, as it's manifested in the life of Gandhi, then you can say that Merton's interest in Buddhism went back to his time at Oakham School in England between 1928 and 1932, where he argued a pro-Gandhian position in a school debate, and incidentally lost the debate. <laughs> but that interest in things Eastern began with him very early. His interest during his university career at Columbia University in, 19, in the 1930s is well documented. Toward the end of 1937, he read Huxley's book, Ends and Means, and devoted several pages to it in his famous autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain. And just for my help, for helpful to me, how many of you know or have read The Seven Story Mountain? That's usually the biggie. OK, wonderful. Then you remember that. Um, he says in the Seven Story Mountain of Ends and Means that it, its most important effect on me, quote, was to make me ransack the university library for books on Oriental mysticism. What I found were the big quarto volumes of the Jesuit Father Viger's French translations of Oriental texts. Um, unfortunately, Merton's early studies of Buddhism weren't very happy. He reports the following, quote, the only practical thing I got out of it was a system for going to sleep at night. You lay flat in bed with a pillow at your and your arms at your sides and your legs straight out and relaxed. And you say to yourself, now I have no feet, no feet, no feet. Now I have no legs, no legs, no legs. Ultimately, he says, I suppose all Oriental mysticism can be reduced to techniques that do the same thing, end of quote. Well, what a, what a callow, um, what a young person's view of a complex theological tradition. Much more important than his own ransacking the library was his meeting with a Hindu monk brahmachari in 1937 or 38. It was actually the Hindu monk Brahmachari who focused Merton's religious reading. Merton went to Brahmachari and asked him for Indian texts to read. And the Hindu monk told him that you should read St. Augustine's Confessions in the Imitation of Christ. <laughs> Interestingly enough, very shortly after this meeting with Brahmachari, Merton records, my reading became more and more Catholic, and it was in November of 1938 that Merton was baptized a Christian. The American Benedictine brother David Stendelrast remarked that he believes that it was Brahmachari who led Merton to embark on his first serious inquiry of Christianity. Um, truly, God's ways are mysterious if a Hindu monk 
brings a Christian to knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So an, an early introduction to Eastern thinking in the Hindu tradition first, and then in uh, Buddhist materials in translation. He had no help in reading that material. His first initial, his initial response to it, very callow. And then in the monastic years, in the early years, Merton's intellectual interest and spiritual energies were quite rightly devoted to other things. But on November the 24th, 1949, Merton records in his journal, and now I'm quoting, I think I shall ask permission to write to a Hindu who wrote me a letter about yoga. I shall ask him to send us some books. A chemist who has been helping us with paint jobs here at the monastery turned out to have been a postulant in a Zen monastery in Hawaii, and he spoke to the community in chapter. I think this is the first reference in the Merton journals to Merton's studies of Buddhism after he became a monk. And it's significant that his first contact was through a practitioner, somebody who practiced the tradition rather than a stack of textbooks about the tradition. It was, in fact, D.T. Suzuki who stimulated Merton's deep interest in Zen Buddhism. Merton's letters to Suzuki begin in the late 1950s, and they continued until after Suzuki's death. And in fact, during the monastic years, Merton's primi primary interest in Buddhism did focus on the traditions of Zen. I think because it was the branch of Buddhism that was most readily available to him in translation in the 50s and 60s. It was just more available in, in English and in the United States at this time. And there's certainly no question that the writer through whom Merton learned Zen was D.T. Suzuki. Now, Buddhist scholars, uh, notably Roger Corliss in the university, suggest that Suzuki's writings might not be the most accurate rendering of Zen that's available, but nevertheless, it was the one that Merton had. Additionally, he corresponded with Father Dumoulin, Dr. John C. Wu, Professor Maceo Abe, Marco Paulus, and others who provided a wider view of the Buddhist traditions. Merton's own writings on Zen occur primarily in two volumes, Mystics and Zen Masters, 1967, and Zen and the Birds of Appetite in 1968. And my own uh, work with, Zen's, uh, with uh, Merton's work in Zen is tracing the influence of Zen on the poetry, which begins someplace in the 1950s. So Asian thought, pre-monastic, Zen tradition, primarily monastic. And then finally, in the fall of 1968, Merton's appreciation and understanding of Buddhism was greatly deepened because he was finally, for the first time, given permission to travel away from the monastery. And the most important aspect of that journey was, again, face-to-face, monk-to-monk encounter with Buddhists, particularly for the first time with Theravadins and Tibetans, or those who practice the Vajrayana tradition of Buddhism. It's hard, I think, to overstate the importance of Merton's encounter with the Tibetans. If Zen were the tradition of Buddhism that Merton really knew during his monastic period when he went to Asia, it was his meeting with Tibetans, and especially with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and the monastic traditions of Tibet that Merton really uh, became interested in. He'd known a little bit about it before through Marco Paulus, and had, in 1963, read um, the book Peaks and Lamas, which many of you, if you know popular Buddhism, may have encountered. He wrote, reported in the Asian Journal, this is Merton, quote, I feel very much at home with the Tibetans, even though much that appears in books about them seems bizarre, if not sinister, end of quote. Well, isn't it the case that when we meet people, um, what we find is very different from the prejudices that we brought to the meeting? This is very clearly um, 
evident in Merton's meeting with the Tibetans. In the journal entries between November the 1st and November the 8th, the period that Merton was in Dharamsala and Darjeeling, his, his re response to Tibetan Buddhism becomes more and more enthusiastic. And I think had he lived, he probably would have returned to Tibet to study with the Lamas. Of his meeting with the Tibetans, Merton says, quote, the most significant thing of all was the way we were able to communicate with one another and share an essentially spiritual experience of Buddhism, which is also somehow in harmony with Christianity, end of quote. We're fortunate to have not only Merton's response and reports of his Asian journal, but reflections from Harold Talbot, an American scholar from Harvard and himself a practicing Tibetan who arranged and accompanied Merton's journey among the Tibetans. Mr. Talbot has said that in terms of tantric or Vajrayana Buddhism, Merton was to the manner born and he took to it as a swan to water. Talbot reports that Merton met each Lama with an in instantaneous recognition, a kind of core ad core loquitur, heart to heart speaking. And Talbot's analysis is that by 1968, Merton had passed through the kind of self emptying that made him limpid and ready to really enter into another tradition. He already had possessed something, according to Talbot, of the pure perception that is developed by practicing Tibetan Buddhism. The other great Asian experience of Merton was the visit to the great carved Buddhas at Pala Narua. So much has been written about that experience that I'm simply going to remind us uh, of it at this point. And those of you who've read the Asian Journal remember that this is the point at which Merton says, I, I really found what I was looking for in Asia. Quote, Merton says, I don't know when in my life I have ever had such a sense of beauty and spiritual validity running together in one aesthetic illumination. Surely with Pala Narua, my Asian pilgrimage has become clear and purified itself. I mean, I know and have seen what I was obscurely looking for. I don't know what else remains, but I have now seen and pierced through the surface and gotten beyond the shadow and the disguise." End of quote. Not much more did remain. Merton died by accidental electrocution on the 10th of December, 1968 but he says he had found what he was looking for, and certainly that must be at least one definition of a happy death. Eastern thought in general, Buddhist study and practice, Tibetan introduction, and a hope to go back to Tibet and study some more. Why would it be that a Christian monk would be so interested in another religious tradition. <clears throat> On December the 12th, 1964, already Merton had written to a correspondent, quote, I have no hesitation in saying that the Buddhist view of reality and life is one which I find extremely practical and acceptable. And indeed, I think it's one of the very great contributions to the universal spiritual, spiritual heritage. It is by no means foreign or hostile to the spirit of Christianity, provided that the Christian outlook does not become bogged down in a slough of pseudo-objective formalities, as I am afraid it sometimes tends to do." End of quote. That's worth attending to. In Buddhist Christian dialogue, Merton is telling us that the difficulty is more likely to be on the Christian side. There's a whole day of creation between Christian creeds and doctrines 
and the attempt of a believer to be Christ-like, as anybody who has tried to do it knows. Something of Merton's distrust for the structural aspects of religious traditions is clear in the talk that he delivered a few hours before his death, in which he says, quote, the time for relying on structures has disappeared. And then he quotes a monk who had been a refugee from a Tibetan monastery who said, from now on, brother, everybody stands on his own feet. Why a Christian, a Roman Catholic priest, a Cistercian monk who loved and, his own, and loved and rejoiced in his own spiritual tradition, why so inter such an interest in Buddhism? I don't see any evidence that Merton was about to leave the church for the Sangha. I think he might well have returned to Tibet for further instruction. His last circular letter to his friends in the United States, written from New Delhi, which is mostly taken up with his experiences among the Tibetans, closes, quote, in my contacts with these new friends, I feel consolation in my own faith in Christ and his indwelling presence. And in an interview with Harold Talbot in the summer of 1992, Talbot said simply, Merton was not leaving and would never have left the church. What I think Merton's interest in Buddhism or what he found helpful and beautiful in Buddhism were practical things, not so much theoretical things, although Merton admired the intricacy and the mathematical beauty in many ways of Buddhist thinking. What I think attracted, to Merton, attracted Merton to Buddhism were three things. First, clear teaching on ways of fostering spiritual development, a way, a path. Secondly, that for Merton in the late 1950s and the 1960s, the Buddhist tradition provided a cultural alternative. And thirdly, and I think this is Merton's central concern always, monastic renewal. A Christian monk had great things to learn from the ancient monastic traditions of Asia. Let me go back and just say a word or two about each of those. First, spiritual development. Merton was for many years pivotal in the teaching and formation of the young monks at Gethsemane. From 1951 to 1955, he was master of scholastics. And from 1955 to 1965, he was master of novices. Practically, that meant that he was constantly involved in helping others to form and articulate the inner life helping others to form and articulate the inner life. Because Zen is about direct, unmediated experience, its language and teaching were of particular value to Merton in this task that he had in the monastery. Zen has a preference for what is concrete and tangible. And if there is ultimate meaning, Zen locates it in the ordinary, humble tasks and problems of daily life. In addition, Zen is often high-spirited, good-humored, and a bit irreverent, which sounds to me a lot like Thomas Merton. These aspects appealed to Merton and were, in my view, a happy corrective to systematic theology and doctrine. Furthermore, the Buddhist tradition is extremely acute psychologically. And through my millennia before the birth of Christ, Buddhism has developed a precise language to speak of interior spiritual development. It has a much more precise language for this than we do in the Christian tradition. It provides not only <coughs> techniques to foster spiritual development, 
but a language to describe the radical internal reordering that happens to people when they pray and develop their inner lives. And Merton was very happy to embrace and to learn from and to apply these practical insights. Secondly, Buddhism was the antithesis of the Western technology and materialism Merton had come to distrust. If you read the Merton journals of the late 50s and 60s, he's um, you know, saying, Gethsemane has become nothing but a cheese factory. All I hear outside is the rattle of machinery doing the work, on and on and on. Uh, his views of American culture, such as we have it in my country, were very um, critical in the 60s, 50s, and 60s. This was the time of the civil rights movement in our country, the Vietnam War, the increase, uh, the proliferation of atomic weaponry, all of that Merton opposed. Now, I think his views of Buddhism and Asian culture were rather romanticized, but as opposed to the getting and taking mentality that Merton diagnosed as characteristic of the illness of America in the 1960s, Buddhism and especially Zen focused on simplicity and purity in the natural world, and Merton was very drawn to this. Merton told both Harold Talbot in uh, India and Abdul Aziz, a Sufi correspondent in Pakistan, that his meditation practice was largely walking in the woods in a state of meditative absorption. The attitude of Zen teaching toward the natural world was consonant with Merton's own deepest practice. For Merton, the sorry state of Western society was but the outward and visible manifestation of the fact that Western tradition had lost its interiority. We as a church community, Merton felt, had lost our interiority. Might be interesting to talk about that in the, in the question and answer period. In a 1968 circular letter to his friends, Merton wrote, quote, our real journey in life is interior. It is a matter of growth, of deepening, of an ever greater surrender to the creative action of love and grace in our hearts. Never was it more necessary for us to respond to that action, end of quote. Buddhism provided models whereby Christians, and this is important because it means that Merton understood Christians could adapt the practices of other religions in light of their fidelity to Jesus. Buddhism provided models whereby Christians could reappropriate something of what I might describe as the interiority of Christ who throughout the Gospels withdraws, anakoreo, a very important Greek verb in the Gospels, who withdraws to commune with his own heart and be still. A stillness that post-Reformation Christianity lost. Thirdly, monastic renewal. Lawrence Cunningham of Notre Dame University wrote a book called Thomas Merton and the Monastic Vision and rightly pointed out that everything in Merton's life and thought ultimately spirals in to his monastic vocation. The ostensible reason for his journey to Asia in 1968 was precisely monastic renewal, to learn from the great monastic traditions of Asia. Dame Jean Leclerc observed, quote, this journey to the East had been prepared for by 30 years of reading. All the same, the purpose remained essentially monastic, directed toward interior growth, and not to the acquisition of knowledge that could later on be used in dialogue with non-Christians. That's a very important point. The purpose of the Asian journal was interior growth, and not to absorb a lot of facts that could later on be used in some kind of academic 
inter-religious inter dialogue. In a paper that he was to have delivered in Calcutta, Merton wrote that he felt it was possible to remain faithful to a Christian monastic commitment and yet, quote, to learn in depth from a Buddhist or Hindu discipline experience. I believe that some of us need to do this in order to improve the quality of our own monastic life and to help in the task of monastic renewal, which has been undertaken in the Western Church, end of quote. Now remember, this is Merton speaking in the first flush of renewal right after the Second Vatican Council. But his own interest in monastic renewal predated the council and certainly grew out of his ministry to the young monks that he taught and his own desire for deeper life as a hermit. He says explicitly that he went to Asia as a pilgrim, a pilgrim to drink from ancient sources of monastic vision and experience in order to become a better and more enlightened monk. Merton had already written extensively on monasticism. He believed that conversion of life, conversio morum in the Benedictine tradition, was central to the monastic enterprise. And central to conversion of life is diminishing the ego, the false self, the little s self, because one who is self-absorbed can't be a good monk, or I would say a good Christian for that matter. One of Merton's attractions to the Tibetan tradition, in my view, was that he encountered it embodied in its monks. But his earlier studies of Zen had provided a particularly valuable set of practices and teachings to help with this problematic false self, this problematic ego self, which is not who we really are, but is the self that we present to the world. The first step in the dissolution of the false self is to wake up. And it is to waking up that I wish to turn in about the last 10 minutes of this talk. Merton wrote, and now be of good cheer, I'm at part three of the lecture. You're only a few minutes from the cookies and the coffee. <laughs> Merton wrote, you can hardly set Christianity and Zen side by side and compare them, this would be like trying to compare mathematics and tennis." End of quote. These remarks are not so much a comparison as a reflection on one way in which Buddhism provided a practical articulation of an issue Merton faced as a Christian monk and a teacher of monks. So what I'm trying to do now is to take all this theoretical business and biographical business I've been talking about and say, okay, here's one example of, one case in point of how this worked for Merton. Buddhism teaches that human life is unsatisfactory. There is an unsatisfactoriness at the root of human life. And the root of that unsatisfactoriness is our craving or desire. The path away from unsatisfactoriness is the path of cessation of craving or desire. In Buddhist tradition, human suffering is not the result of sin or of the fall as per Christianity, but of ignorance. And the remedy if this is the diagnosis, the remedy is to wake up to the nature of reality, to see the origin of the problem and its rather simple solution. Simple at least in diagnosis, not so simple in practice, it seems to me. The meditative and ritual practices of the various branches of Buddhism are either to bring one to this realization or to experience, uh, or to express thanksgiving for having experienced it. I think Merton understood this rudimentary, and I don't mean uh, in, in any way to use that as a negative term, I mean this fundamental Buddhist teaching. He understood it extremely clearly. In the last talk he gave in Bangkok, he explored the idea of ignorance 
and wrote, quote, both Buddhism and Christianity agree that the root of man's problem, and I just simply will quote, those of you who have trouble with exclusive language, please um, add man, woman, but I'm enough of a pedant that if Merton wrote it a certain way, I don't feel I have the right to edit his writing. So uh, pardon those of you who were offended there. But both Buddhism and Christianity agree that the root of man's problem is that his consciousness is all fouled up, and he doesn't perceive reality as it fully and really is. This is the source of all our problems. Consequently, Christianity, bless you, and Buddhism look primarily to a transformation of consciousness, a transformation and a liberation of the truth imprisoned in man by ignorance and error. Boy, that's a really different diagnosis of the human condition than to say it's all because of Eve and the apple and the snake in the fall. Yeah? Christianity and Buddhism look primarily to a transformation of human consciousness, a liberation of the truth imprisoned in us by ignorance and error. In Mystics and Zen Masters, Merton observed, the main purpose of Buddhism is an ontological awakening to the ultimate ground of being, or the Buddha which one is. For Zen, there is no true Buddha outside the awakened true self." End of quote. The metaphor for fundamental ignorance, this fundamental ignorance that enslaves us, is blindness. It amused me greatly this morning when I read the morning office to discover that the gospel for mass today was, those of you who attended mass today, it was Jesus healing the blind man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Same issue. The metaphor for our fundamental ignorance is blindness, the transformation of consciousness that comes when we are able to see when we wake up from the dream state in which we normally wander is really the point. For Merton, Zen is this direct way to waking up to reality. Merton understood Zen both practically and philosophically to be about waking up, this term satari or enlightenment that we worry about how properly to translate. I think we might think of in terms of waking up, and I hope my Buddhist friends will correct me if I'm in error about that. D.T. Suzuki, whose work was so influential in Merton's thinking, wrote, quote, Satori may be defined as an intuitive looking into the nature of things in contradistinction to analytical or logical understanding. Practically, it means the unfolding of a new world hitherto unperceived. The worst enemy of Zen experience is the intellect, which consists in discriminating subject from object. This is a very anti-Cartesian point of view. And I think one of the things that Merton was really tuned into was that we in the West really um, got in the wrong Descartes. <laughs> I couldn't pass it up. It was just there. I couldn't pass it up. One of the great illusions that we labor under is this illusion that, that I think, therefore I am, and that our thinking is the nature of reality. Merton really understood that as a terrific fallacy that has taken us uh, on a really bad path. And I'm sorry to use the word bad. It's a, such a moral, heavy word. But it, it really has been a huge sidetrack in, in the thinking of human beings in the West. That immediate experience of waking up beyond the subject-object dualism of Descartes uh, is really what Merton points us toward. 
Now, some of your eyes are glazing over here, and I don't blame you at all. So to keep us from floating off into utter abstraction, um, those of you who, who didn't um, have to study philosophy as an undergraduate and don't want to do this Cartesian thing, let's look at a poem, uh, an object, uh, something creative and in front of us that Merton wrote, which I think talks about this experience of waking up. It's a poem that occurs in Merton's 1963 collection of poetry, Emblems of a Season of Fury. And what I think we're invited to experience in this poem is the experience of waking up. The first two stanzas are parallel in structure, but I'd ask you to note that in the first stanza, the singer is a plant, and in the second stanza, the, the singer is the plant's spirit. A yellow flower, light and spirit, sings by itself for nobody. A golden spirit, light and emptiness, sings without a word by itself. The material nature of the plant or the flower morphs into this incorporeal spirit. And so the poem begins the dissolution of subject-object dualism that is such a primary illusion for us. Singing, the metaphor for praise and prayer in the Christian tradition, is done for the sake of the act itself rather than for somebody. What are we supposed to do? Pray and sing, and we do it for the act itself. It's an egoless song in that regard, a wordless song. A yellow flower, light and spirit, sings by itself for nobody. A golden spirit, light and emptiness, sings without a word by itself. Let no one touch this gentle sun in whose dark eye someone is awake. What we've got is a, is a black-eyed Susan. Those of you who are gardeners have figured out what the flower is. But let's not reach out to grasp it. Let's let it be as it is. Let no one touch this gentle sun in whose dark eye someone is awake. No light, no gold, no name, no color, and no thought. Oh, wide awake. A golden heaven sings by itself a song to nobody. A black-eyed Susan, a daisy with yellow petals in a dark center, a gentle sun with a dark eye. Let's not disturb it. Don't touch it. Don't objectify it. Don't disturb the tranquility of its being. But somebody is awake in looking at the flower and perceiving it. That someone is awake in its dark eye suggests that the flower is looking back at the one who is looking at it. It's an interpenetration of perception, not the human looking at the world out there, which is a reality some, some, some place that's separate from the seeing, but it's in looking back and forth, the human looking at the plant, the plant looking back at the human. It's rather like the image from John Donne's poem, The Ecstasy of the Two Lovers Who Look at Each Other, and talks about, the poem remember, talks about their threading eye beams, that the eyes from the boy go out and they meet the eye beams from the girl that come together. The good morrow also has this image in it in, in uh, Donne. Or recall that happy heretic, Meister Eckhart, who said, the eye wherein I see God is the same eye wherein God sees me? Hmm? Same image, same idea. Clearly, Merton's poem is about perception, about seeing, about being awake. Most awake because least self-conscious, the flower is complete in itself. It is a heaven, a perfection, a paradise which sings by itself to nobody. 
complete in itself. It requires no one to see it and objectify it, and its song requires no hearer for it to exist. So much for the tree falling in the forest. As Thich Nhat Hanh says in The Miracle of Mindfulness, the subject of knowledge cannot exist independently from the object of knowledge. The absence of a distinct persona or speaker in the poem mirrors exactly what Merton is trying to say in the poem. The unselfconscious are complete in themselves, pure perceivers. The flower is seen but not grasped, and it becomes an occasion of wide awakeness, which is equated here with heaven. Bringing the Buddhist epistemology of the poem into the sphere of Christian cosmology. The manner or way of being awake in the poem, I think, is enlightenment or satori. And there are a lot of poems of Merton's in the late 50s and the 1960s that do this. They are, if I may use this rather awkward phrase, concretized intuitions of Buddhism's insistence on pure perception. Over and over again, what Merton's poems are trying to do in the 60s is to say something about or to capture this experience of pure perception, which we have available to us all the time at every given moment. This poem mirrors the act of awareness, and the act of awareness is the point. In so many ways, Merton is telling us, wake up. On March the 12th, 1959, Merton wrote to D.T. Suzuki, it seems to me that Zen is the very atmosphere of the Gospels, and the Gospels are bursting with it. Now, I took that statement as a koan, a problem posed to me by the Master. It seems to me that Zen is the atmosphere of the Gospels, and the Gospels are bursting with it. And I thought for a long time about what that meant. And the more I thought about it, the more it struck me that in the Gospels, Jesus is very much about the business of getting people to wake up. In his reversal of commonly expected action or responses, in his startling reinterpretation of Torah, in his preference for association with the wrong people in the wrong places, are you with me? But most dramatically, I thought about the paradigmatic invitation of Jesus at the beginning of St. John's Gospel. Come and see. Hmm? And then the great promise in the end of the same chapter, and you shall see greater things than these. Come and see. That's the great wake-up call of the Gospels. Jesus invites people to direct, unmediated experience of the ultimate. Come, an invitation to wake up to, to something whole and synthetic rather than something intellectual. See, an invitation to perceive, to understand, to pierce through illusion. Little wonder the blind man of Jericho says to Jesus, as he said in this morning's gospel, Master, let me receive my sight, because sight is the ultimate gift of grace. Merton took up the invitation to come. He became a Roman Catholic, a Cistercian monk, and a priest. And in the context of this Christian response, his writing and calligraphy and photography all attest to his seeing. Then Merton answered an invitation to visit other traditions. And in the case of Buddhism, his interest revolved around the various means by which Buddhists see. Not surprisingly, the language of the Palinarua experience in the Asian journal is the language of sight. Go back and look at that, uh, that entry in the journal. He speaks of looking, vision, inner clearness, clarity, 
illumination of having seen what he was looking for. I have pierced through the surface. I have got beyond the shadow and the disguise. It's a most complete expression of spiritual awakening, and it suggests that when on December the 10th, 1968, Merton came to know the Christ of the burnt men, he was fully awake. And I would suggest that he is also fully awakening. If Merton leaves us an invitation in the 21st century, it is to wake up. The focus of his spiritual writing and his work in monastic theology was the nature of the self and the inner life and the God who is its essence in Christianity. He wrote to, to, to Suzuki, the Christ we seek is within us, our inmost self, is our inmost self. Merton wrote about contemplation, which, as he says in New Seeds of Contemplation, is more than a consideration of abstract truths about God. It is awakening, enlightenment, the amazing intuitive grasp by which love gains certitude of God's creative dramatic intervention in our daily life. Contemplation, Merton continues, is a sudden gift of awareness, an awakening to the real, capital R, within all that is real, little r. Contemplation is a sudden gift of awareness, an awakening to the real within all that is real, a vivid awareness of infinite being at the root of our own limited being, an awareness of our contingent reality as a gift from God, a free gift of love. And that, of course, is precisely what attracted Merton to Zen. Zen, he writes, quote, seeks not to explain but to pay attention, to become aware, to be mindful, to develop a certain kind of consciousness. In analyzing the importance of Zen and the Birds of Appetite 25 years after it was written, Matthias Neumann noted Merton understood Zen's existential method, and it reminds Christians of the crucial importance of regaining an immediate perception of spiritual things. Zen challenges Christians to learn to pay attention and to see with a kind of consciousness that sees without preconceptions. Harold Talbot observed that this was Merton's affinity with the Tibetans. Quote, Merton was thrilled to discover that the vast and complex treasury of forms and practices that confront the observer of the tantric traditions of Tibet was all an expression of awakening that is in itself so utterly simple. Jesus healing the blind man. Jesus, with the great invitation, come and see. Zen, with many techniques to help us to do that, and Merton, the priest who throws the bridge over the two traditions. thing, and that is I am very hard of hearing. So if I ask you to repeat, I always tell the students this because they're afraid they've said the wrong thing. If, you've, if I ask you to repeat, it's, it's fine. It's just that I didn't hear you, okay? Yes, sir, please, on the front row. Um, yes, I was just wondering if you could shed any light on why Merton managed to escape papal correctness and Matthew Fox didn't. Why did Merton e escape papal correction and Matthew Fox didn't? Well, Merton didn't escape papal correction. Merton was indeed silenced on one issue. 
He was silenced on the issue of writing about war and peace. And in fact, the Bert, the, mo, the Bert, let me start that all over again. <laughs> the book that Merton wrote called Peace in the Post-Christian Era, which he wrote in 1963, was first published this year, 2005, because he was silenced by the, um, by the Abbot General of the Cistercian Order on uh, instructions from Rome. So um, he, he didn't, he didn't manage to escape the, uh, the censure. He was told that it was not Christian to write about war and peace. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, I think I saw your hand next. Well, uh, <laughs> just two parallel lines that I think uh, intersect with what you said. <clears throat> One is uh, Bert E.F. Schumacher, who also had this Buddhist experience and was led to a, a kind of revolutionary view of economics. Mm -hmm. And he traced that back to the Buddhist tradition and had a similar conversion experience. But the one I want to mention, which is appropriate here, is that about five years ago we had Elaine McGinnis, I don't know if you know her, but she is a, a nun who lives in, in Toronto and she uh, is a Zen master. She went to, to Japan, and she will be appearing on television, I think, in early December. But she spoke in the same place, and there's a link here, I think, between what you said and what she said, just with the same message to awake and awaken all of us. But, uh, I think that her contribution in Canada has not been recognized as much as it should be as a woman who has gone through the first Zen experience. Thank you. And Elaine? Elaine McGinnis. Elaine McGinnis. Yes. She's, she received the Order of Canada uh, some time back, and she's been a member of an order. She was a beautiful musician, went to, to Japan and spent 10 years becoming a Zen master, the most unusual yeah. experience. There actually is a very good um, source of, thank you, a very good source of information on this that's available for those of you with internet connection. It's called Monastic Interreligious Dialogue, MID. Uh, and the MID puts its bulletin online for about 25 years. It, it's primarily um, an, a ministry of the Benedictine order. But Benedictines and the children of Benedict, like the Cistercians, have been meeting with um, Buddhist monks and nuns and actually doing exchanges. The Westerners go to the Eastern monasteries, and then the Eastern monks and nuns come to the Western monasteries. And all of that has been, um, it has been uh, recorded in this monastic interreligious dialogue bulletin. It's, it's not a, a scholarly source. It's mostly. Uh, transcripts of the talks of the two practitioners, very easily accessible to you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, he uh, comments probably started with the contact movement of contact educator, and we should follow later on by his successor, um, John May, and then Thomas Freeman. Now, in your talk, you have to I'm more interested in the practicality of, because I do engage in contact with the prayer, mm -hmm. for about several years. And I would be interested to, to hear what is your comment on, maybe you can help me to be more engaged in the contact with the prayer. I do have a second question, but I'd like to okay. answer the first one. One at a time. I, I don't have a two-question brain. Um, and, and you're just right. Your, your trajectory is just absolutely uh, accurate. What what we see re-emerging in Merton is the contemplative prayer. Yes, he was asking. He's saying he is a practitioner of contemplative prayer, and he sees Merton in the line of uh, Merton, John Main, Lawrence Freeman. In, in my country, we'd probably add Basil Pennington and the Centering Prayer Movement. And you're absolutely right in that trajectory. What comes before Merton, or Merton, is, is a modern manifestation of the kind of prayer that's described in The Cloud of Unknowing, the 14th century English work. Um, if you want to read a Merton work devoted particularly to this aspect of prayer, 
uh, he has a book entitled Contemplative Prayer. Do you know it? Okay, that's what I would point you to in terms of his writing on contemplative prayer. Now, what is, is there something specific you'd like me to follow up with that? No, I'm just asking if you have any suggestion to a person who is a visionary and because you're so familiar with Thomas and you can give some advice as to how to better practice and contemplate. Well, I, I'm such a poor prayer myself, I wouldn't um, begin to <laughs> try to tell someone else how to pray, uh, other than to say, um, the way to learn to pray is to pray. And I've listened to so many of Merton's tapes over the years, and you know, he, he makes a very clear distinction that I think we don't do too well with in the Christian tradition, that reading about prayer isn't praying. <laughs> you know, reading, Reading one more how-to book about prayer is not praying. And a lot of us, like me, I include here, I'm not pointing the finger at anybody else. We, go, we continue to go to prayer workshops and buy another series of tapes to listen to in the car. How am I doing? Is some, oh, you too? You guys as well. <laughs> Instead of actually taking the time, as you so clearly know as a practitioner of contemplative prayer, to pray. Uh, I think what Merton might say to us, and I'm very hesitant to, to say what anybody else might think, but, but what I read Merton saying over and over again about the deepest kind of prayer is that if you want to do it, do it. At the end of his life, he gave a wonderful series of talks to the Precious Blood Sisters in Alaska. This is one of the least known series of talks that Merton gave, and it's to me one of the best things that he said about prayer. Um, he gave uh, a retreat day to the Sisters of the Precious Blood in Alaska. It, you'll find them in a little book called Thomas Merton in Alaska. And the last thing he says to the sisters is, what we have to, if, if you want to pray, pray. And if you aren't praying, or if we aren't praying, as he puts it, then maybe what we have to face up to is we really don't want to be praying. Now, you had a second question. Would you like to follow up? Now, I come from the, the East, okay? And I can look at, um, I mean, I can see the fact that people in Asia always look to the West and say, oh, the West is so good, better. <laughs> and in the 60s in America, everything was in chaos. So I look at the East and say, well, these people, these people have better religions and practice. And I'm not surprised Thomas was influenced by that. That's why he looks in East Buddhism. And to me, if I'm correct, I, mean, I have read on Buddhism, I'm read on the old original scriptures, and I don't think it's a religion. I don't think he ever said it's a religion. He and being Merton? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And because I don't, I read the Buddhism, I think it is more a, a a how-to, a guide to be in an environment, okay? Now, which is very similar in the concept, but uh, it's, it's, um, it's not a religion as such, and it's more a, a self, realized self-fulfillment, just taking oneself to the environment, okay? And, And I'm sure we can learn a lot of things uh, from the Buddhism of how to be making oneself better in terms of being uh, rich in the environment, being sanctified and so on. But uh, I don't think um, Merton has rich powers to say, uh, to compare Christianity, or to, to draw Buddhism to Christianity or Christianity to Buddhism. Yeah, well, I think he does say, you know, and I quoted that passage where, where he says trying to compare Buddhism and Christianity is like trying to compare mathematics and tennis. And I think what he's saying to us as a metaphor here is that it, they are two different kinds of things. So I, I think I would, I think Merton would agree with what you've just said. Yes, sir. If, if I'm correct in understanding the direction of uh, Mr. Merton's philosophy. It, 
tends towards the self individually gaining insight, waking up. But most of us in our Christian experience practice communally. Uh -huh. We worship communally, we join prayer groups communally, we have Bible studies communally, we study communally as we're doing here this evening. Did he have any direction about the communal growth? Uh -huh. that, thank you, that's a very helpful and, a, and it's a very good corrective. Uh, remember the context of all of this is the Cistercian Monastery where seven times a day the monks pray together. And I, th I think all of Merton's thought is to be seen in the context of the community of the monastery. Um, and yes, there's a lot of writing about, uh, I mean, Merton does say a great deal about our life together. I simply am not addressing that particular issue this, this evening, but you're, you're quite helpful um, in allowing me to say, uh, don't assume that Merton only sees the individual as the locus of Christian practice. That would be a really, a, a really unfortunate misunderstanding of Merton, who constantly calls us as a community to witness to what we see as individuals. We have to wake up individually and then as a co collective or as a community of those who are awakened, we are empowered to live the life. Um, uh, well, I can do some quotation, but thank you. Yes, his context is always communal. I simply have been focusing on one aspect of his thought tonight, and that is the the um, experience of enlightenment. I think he, w you know, I think that the the thing that Merton pushes us toward is to understand that for the community to act in an in a way that sees the persons in the community have to be able to see. And what he worries about for us as Christians is that we can get into the community and never do the hard work of waking up individually. We can ride on somebody else's coattails or we can ride the coattails of doctrine. That little passage that I talked about, about structures, and the, that Merton was so pleased with that quotation, now everybody has to stand on his own feet. I, I think the danger that Merton sees for us as the community of the church is that uh, we might slip by and not be as individual persons awakened. Does that make sense at all? That's the danger, I think. Um, yes, please, sir. It sounds like uh, Merton's a good journalist, you know, he was very much a writer, yes, sir. And my question is, 